and I am here with my colleague, Jessica Diaz, and we are with the Los Angeles County Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. Today's webinar will cover two topics. The first topic, called Serving Court Papers, is how to notify parties to attend a hearing in small claims court. The second topic is how to exchange and submit evidence before your court hearing. This presentation provides information for both the party who is suing, called the plaintiff, and the party who is being sued, called the defendant. For both topics, we will play a pre-recorded video. At the conclusion of each video, we will be answering your questions during a question and answer session. Please take note that your microphone is currently on mute. You may ask questions at any time during or after the video by submitting them through the chat box located on the lower right of the WebEx interface page. It is a good idea to leave the chat box open even if you don't ask questions because you will be able to view valuable information entered in the chat during the course of this webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website along with other small claims resources. Just go to dcba.lacounty.gov and click on the Small Claims tab. At the conclusion of today's presentation, we would appreciate you completing a four question survey to let us know how we are doing and give us a suggestions about additional small claims webinars. All feedback is welcome. Okay, please start the first video now. Hello. In this video, we'll go over the process and requirements for notifying parties to attend a hearing in small claims court. This process is referred to as serving court papers. We'll assume that you've already filed the plaintiff's claim, Form SC100, and received back the stamped copies from the court clerk. Now, it's time to serve the court papers on the defendant. This process is designed to ensure that all parties are aware of the claim that you have filed. So the rules are strict and must be followed closely. If a mistake is made while serving the defendant, you may jeopardize the outcome of your case. There are three sets of rules that you must follow when serving court papers in small claims. One, who can serve court papers? Two, where court papers can be served? Three, how court papers can be served. First, as the plaintiff, you are not allowed to serve court papers yourself. By law, someone who is not one of the parties to the case must serve papers on the defendant. In practice, it's wise to exclude anyone who stands to benefit directly, financially or otherwise, from the outcome of the trial. Instead, you must have a disinterested person at least 18 years of age serve the papers. Disinterested persons include the sheriff's office, a registered process server, or even a friend or family member. If you ask a friend or relative to serve court papers on the defendant, make sure that they complete SC 104, the form for proof of service, and submit it to the court at least five days before the hearing date. If you request that the sheriff serve the court papers, you must provide the sheriff with two court-stamped copies of Form SC 100 for each defendant along with the signed Sheriff Service Instructions. It's important to note the sheriff charges a service fee of $40 for each defendant on whom they serve papers, unless a fee waiver has been approved. Process servers do not accept fee waivers and their fees vary. Both the sheriff and a registered process server use their own proof of service forms, so follow up with them for the most accurate information. Second, Small claims rules of service require that court papers be served in the state of California. There are only two exceptions to this rule. If you were involved in a vehicle accident, court papers may be served to the driver or registered owner in the state where they reside. Also, if you are involved in a dispute that concerns California real estate, court papers may be served to the property owner in the state where they are located. If you need to serve court papers on someone out of state, and you don't fall under one of these exceptions, then you'll need to file your claim either in the state where the defendant will be served or in California General Civil Court. Third, you must use a valid method of service for it to be recognized by the court. 
there are two valid methods of service in small claims. Personal service, when the court papers are handed directly to the defendant in person, and substituted service, when the papers are handed to an eligible person who is at least 18 years old, other than the defendant. Eligible persons include a person who lives with the defendant or who is responsible for the location where the defendant works or receives mail. When using substituted service, an identical set of papers must be mailed first class to the defendant at the same address where the papers were left. Note that substituted service is the only method allowed when serving court papers on a corporation or public entity. When serving by personal service, the server checks box A on page 2. Enter the day, time, and place the plaintiff's claim was handed to the defendant. If the plaintiff's claim was instead served by substituted service, the server checks box B on page 2. Select the option below that correctly describes the eligible person who will receive the court papers. When serving court papers on a defendant that is a corporation or public entity, you'll usually check the box, an adult who seems to be in charge where person one usually works. Enter the day, time, place, and description of the person who was given the papers. To find the names of eligible people to accept court papers on behalf of corporations, limited liability companies, and limited partnerships, go to the California Secretary of State website and use the business search feature. When serving papers on a public entity, Information on whom and where to serve is often found on the Claim for Damages form. In most cases, you will have already filed this form with the public entity before your small claims case was started, so check there first. If you are uncertain to whom to serve the papers, request the information from the public entity you are suing. And don't forget to complete the section about mailing a second set of papers after they were served. There are different deadlines for serving court papers depending on the method and location. These deadlines ensure that the defendant has adequate time to prepare for the hearing. See the table for the deadlines relevant to your case. Importantly, there are two additional methods of service that other courts may allow, but that are not allowed in small claims cases heard in Los Angeles County. Service by publication in a newspaper and service by certified mail. If a person is named as a defendant in a small claims case, they have the option of filing a defendant's claim, which will be heard together with the plaintiff's original claim on the court date. A defendant's claim is a request for damages from the plaintiff. A defendant's claim may be related to the plaintiff's original claim, or it may concern an unrelated event. Either way, the defendant must complete SC 120 to file their own claim. If the defendant decides to proceed with a claim of their own, they must submit it to the court and serve papers on the plaintiff following most of the same rules as the plaintiff's claim, but with shorter time requirements. The defendant's claim must be served on the plaintiff at least five days before the hearing date. However, if the plaintiff's claim was served on the defendant 10 days or less prior to the hearing date, then the defendant's claim may be served as little as one day before the hearing date. If the defendant is unable to have the defendant's claim served, then the defendant should notify the judge on the day of the hearing. The judge may then decide to either hear, postpone, or dismiss the defendant's claim. This concludes our summary of serving court papers. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much for watching this pre recorded video. And now Jessica Diaz is going to ask me some common questions that people ask us regarding the serving court papers process. So we're waiting for the first question to come up. Okay, the first question is, the defendant moved and I don't know their new address. What can I do? So in this particular situation, the post office can be very helpful. One of the, of the things that you can do is to write a letter to the defendant and uh, as soon as we can we're going to post a picture of what that looks like here it is okay so if you're the one who is suing you're the plaintiff so you're going to put your name in the upper left hand corner you have to add postage the defendant's name and address is placed in the middle of the envelope now take note that in the upper right and the lower left it says 
return service requested, do not forward. You wanna make sure you put that on the envelope because what that means is if the defendant has left a forwarding address with the post office, the post office is not gonna send them this letter. Instead, they're gonna send it back to the plaintiff, back to the one who sent the letter with the new address of the defendant. So this is a way for you to find out where they have moved to without them even being aware that you know their new address. Uh, so this is a very uh, easy, inexpensive way to find out that information. Now in this envelope, you don't even need to put any correspondence because the purpose of sending it really isn't to communicate with the defendant, but it's to find out what their new address is. The second way that the post office can help you is they have a form on the United States Post Office website, which is called Request for Change of Address or Box Holder Information Needed for Service of Legal Process. So what this means is if somebody has left a forwarding address with the post office, that is not really public information, except if that information is needed to serve legal papers, the post office will release that. On this form, you need to put down your case number, the court that the case is going to be heard at, et cetera, your contact information. And given that, the post office will let you know if there is a forwarding address. The second feature of this form, which is great, is that if the defendant has a uh, P.O. box and you want to find out their actual address behind the P.O. box, meaning whenever you get a, 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 a post office box with the post office, you have to register and provide an actual physical address where you are. So the post office is going to release that. So now you know where the person actually is physically located. So this form does those uh, two things for you that can assist you in locating the defendant if they have moved. Well, if this doesn't work, what's your next game plan? There are websites on the internet like fastpeoplesearch.com and there is a multitude of them. Many of them are free and you can enter a person's name, approximate location where they live like uh, Susan Smith living in Los Angeles, California, and they will uh, provide results of where these people are located. It's not 100%. But uh, from my past experience, I found that in the majority of times, it has been very helpful. If you want to do a deeper search, there are websites where you pay a fee. And uh, then it's, it's more probable that you can find an individual. Uh, other tricks are, you know, all know that we uh, sometimes uh, like to uh, reconnect with old friends. So we look on Facebook, we Google their names. So the internet has a wealth of information if you just look around to see if you can find where the individual lives who you want to sue. Okay, thank you. Next question. Okay. What should I do if the defendant won't open the door? So a common way of having papers served is that you pay the sheriff the $40 fee, as it said in the video, and uh, the sheriff goes over to the defendant's house and knocks on the door. Now people respond to the sheriff in different ways. Some people say, oh my goodness, this is an authority figure. This is an important person. I had better open the door. And then a uh, service is accomplished and there's no problem. Other situations go, uh-oh, this doesn't look good. Even though I'm home, I'm not opening up the door. And legally, they don't have to. So how do you get the papers served? An alternative could be to hire a registered process server where you would have to pay a fee and they do not accept fee waivers. 
uh, the registered process server shows up without a uniform, looks a bit less intimidating, and there is a likelihood the person would open up the door because they feel, as I said, maybe less threatened. It all depends on the attitude of the of the defendant. Now, if you have used the registered of the uh, sheriff first initially, and then now you need a process server. When you get to court, if you do have fees that you pay to the process server, you could say that at your court hearing and the judge will take under consideration if he wants to add he or she the judge, if they want to add that fee to your judgment because you tried to use the sheriff, it wasn't successful, and now you needed to have an additional expense for a process server. So that's something that you want to remember. Okay, thank you. Next question. Come on, we actually have some follow-up questions if I could read those to you. Okay, terrific. Um, so we had a question. How do you serve if you can't find the defendant at home and can't help someone living with him or at a place of employment? And I don't know if you've covered that, but maybe you can speak to that. Okay. The bottom line is you have to serve in order to win your judgment. So let's say this person is hiding, hiding, or they're in a, a, an area where they have a gate in front of their home and they never come out and they're just avoiding everything. You're basically stuck. If you can't show the court that you were able to serve, even though you know where that person is, you cannot move forward. So you might have to wait, file your case again. You can always ask the court for a postponement. So that might give you a couple more months until the person that you want to sue, maybe they uh, aren't as anxious anymore. They feel they're not going to avoid answering the door because they figure that their issues are gone. And so then you'll be more successful later. But ultimately, if you can't serve, you can't win your judgment, unfortunately. Are there any other follow up questions? Yeah, just 1 more and then we'll move on to the next topic. Um, so 1 more person asked, what if the defendant is avoiding service or someone in the home refuses the paperwork? So I think you can answer that. But if you have anything else to add. Well, if the sheriff opens up, I mean, if they open up the door to the sheriff and let's say they don't tell the truth, they say they're not the person. They don't know who the person is. They're gone or they say that person doesn't live here anymore, the sheriff is not going to really challenge them. They have to accept what they say. Sometimes a plaintiff has provided a picture to the sheriff. So when the door is open, the sheriff does see it is in fact that person because they have a picture of the defendant. I can't tell you exactly what the sheriff does in that case, if they recognize that the person is not being truthful and they have a picture, you'd have to inquire with the sheriff's department to ask if their procedure is where the sheriff says, okay, I'm serving you anyway because you're the same person as this picture. That I can't tell you. You'd have to ask the sheriff. Great, thanks. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next question. Okay, the next question is, I want to serve my landlord. How do I find where the landlord is located? Okay, okay. So um, we have on on the uh, PowerPoint. I want to take this opportunity to show you this terrific form that's with the um, state court system. And uh, in the video, we showed you the form SC one hundred four. This form accompanies it because it's the SC 104 C. What's terrific about this form is it does give you tips about how to serve businesses and government entities. So it provides extra information about how to get service accomplished. If you look in the middle of this page, page two, it says landlord. So it's really important about that is it says, if you cannot find the landlord, you don't know where they are, you can always serve their property manager. Now, if you live in a large apartment building, for instance, 
there generally is a management office on the premises. So the sheriff or your friend or a process server can simply serve the management office in the building. So sometimes that can be extremely helpful. Now, the first thing I say to a caller when they ask about a, a landlord tenant problem for small claims is make sure you've properly identified the legal name of the landlord. So our suggestion is to contact for uh, properties located in Los Angeles County is to contact the county tax assessor office and their phone number is 213-974-3441. I think we're gonna either place it on the chat or we're gonna put it somewhere on our, uh, on our PowerPoint. 213-974-3441. Now, with this phone number, once you get to a live person, you provide them with the address of the property that is the issue of why you are suing, and also, if you know, the assessor ID number. Once the, uh, you have provided that information, then the clerk can give you ownership information and where the tax bill is being mailed. So this really tells you the name that is on the property deed. That name should be the name of the defendant that you are suing if you are suing your landlord. You might, as a second defendant, depending on the circumstances, also include a management company as a second defendant, depending on the situation, but that management company is not gonna be listed with the tax assessor's office. It simply is a management company that the landlord might have hired. Now, once you have that information from the tax assessor, if the owner is a corporation, a limited liability company, or a limited partnership, then apart from serving the management office, which maybe they don't have a management company, is you would serve, as it was discussed in the video, where you're serving a, a corporation, limited liability company, et cetera, and you would serve their agent for service that's designated on the Secretary of State website, or you can serve uh, officers of the company also if you can't find the agent for service. If the property ends up being owned in a trust, then you serve whoever is designated as the trustee and the tax assessor has that information. So if the property says it's a Smith Family Trust, you say, great, thank you very much, is a trustee listed? And they say, oh yeah, this is John Smith, trustee for the Smith Family Trust. Then that's who you serve, John Smith on behalf of, of the trust, and or you could also serve the management company if they have one. So these are the tips that we give people when they have uh, landlord tenant questions about serving court papers. Okay, thank you. Next question. Okay, here we go. Can the defendant ever be served at a PO box? Now, for instance, when we discussed that first form that we had with the post office that said request for box holder information and change of address, what that means is you cannot serve a post office box in the United States postal facility. And the reason is there's no attendant there. So there's nobody to give it to. So what that form told you is what is the physical address behind the box? And that's where the, the uh, landlord or the person could be served. Now, if the defendant has what's called a private mailbox, which is at a mailbox receiving agency, those private mailboxes can be served. An example would be if they have a box at the UPS store or mailbox, et cetera, because there's an attendant there. And legally that attendant is, uh, is able to accept service on behalf of the defendant. So the answer is, Yes and no. You can't serve the post office box at the United States Post Office itself, but you can at a private agency. Next question, please. 
I am serving the plaintiff's claim to a corporation who has their agent for service in Sacramento. How do I get the paper served? Okay, now the Sacramento Sheriff will serve papers to any defendant or their agent for service who is in the county of Sacramento. The Los Angeles Sheriff cannot serve out of the boundaries of LA County. So if you need to have papers served in another county, then you either have to contact their Sheriff's Department or uh, hire a process server or whatever to serve the papers in that other county. Now, what you are seeing on the screen now are the instructions to the Sheriff of the County of Sacramento. Now, as I said, the Los Angeles County has its own form. If you were, if you were to use the LA Sheriff to serve papers in LA County, but this is the one that you have to use for Sacramento. So, the instructions are, if you send them the papers by mail, is to complete this form, and we have the link if you want to just uh, download it yourself, and be very uh, conscious of the fact that when it says party to be served, they want you to list the actual defendant who you are suing, ABC Corporation. But then it says, who is the agent who's going to accept papers on their behalf? So don't confuse when it says party to be served to put their agent. Their agent goes under the defendant's name. So you fill out this form, be sure to sign it, include two copies of the plaintiff's claim, all the attachments, everything that the court gives you when you file, and a check made payable to the Sacramento Sheriff's Department for $40. Now, as I said in the video, service has to be done a minimum of 30 days before the court date if it's served out of county. Now, the sheriff is unable to serve immediately, so they they can't get it just at the 30 day period because they need time to serve. So they're saying add an extra 10 days for them to process your paperwork and serve timely. So the Sacramento Sheriff's Department has to have, a, have the paperwork a minimum of 40 days prior to the court date. Now, recently what's happened, I think just in the beginning of 2021, the Sacramento Sheriff's Department now has electronic filing, which is absolutely great. So you don't have to mail all of these documents to the sheriff. You can instead upload it and send it to them. Now, uh, you would be providing some kind of credit card information or debit card information. If you have a fee waiver, include that with the documents that you are uploading to them and they will honor the fee waiver the same way that the Los Angeles Sheriff's does, so there is no cost. Now, on the um, screen that you are uh, viewing in the upper right-hand corner, it says help. When you click on help, it provides additional information if you're having any difficulty following how to register and send the paperwork to the Sacramento Sheriff. So I hope that answered your questions, how to get your paperwork up to uh, Sacramento. Okay, thank you. Next question. Okay, in the video, it talks about there are two exceptions uh, in terms of serving out of the state of California. One exception is if you got in an accident here in California, with an out-of-state driver or the owner of the vehicle lives out of state. So, and the other exception has to do with a property owner. But right now, we're gonna just discuss the car accident situation. So, how do you serve a driver or registered owner who is not living in California? Well, we have a wonderful resource on the state website. That's at courts.ca.gov. And when you look under small claims and then research your case, and it has options because it provides a lot of information, the one that's highlighted in yellow says car accidents with out-of-state drivers. So when you open up that, 
it gives you a step-by-step -step instruction how to do it. Now, what's important is when you list the out-of-state driver or registered owner on your defendant's claim, they say also list underneath that driver's name, say serve the Department of Motor uh, Vehicles Legal Affairs Division, and it gives the address in Sacramento. There are two ways to serve the Legal Affairs Division. One is by registered mail accompanied with a uh, $2 check sent over to that address. And another is if you wanted to hire a, a process server, uh, or I guess you could even use the Sacramento Sheriff's Department, and they would serve at that DMV location. After following these instructions, then it says the next step is to actually serve that individual who is now out of state. To do that, you're going to either contact a registered process server, and we showed you that website before where you can find one out of state, or if the county where that person is living in, let's say it's going to be uh, in Las Vegas, so that's Clark County. If the Clark County Sheriff's Department serves papers, then you could send the papers to them out of state and have them serve the papers for you. And then they would uh, provide a proof of service and send it to the small claims clerk to show by the time of the hearing that the papers were in fact served to that out of state driver or registered owner. So this is a wonderful resource on this website it is very explicit. And so uh, this is how the process is done. Now, it takes additional time to do all of this. So when you get your court date, don't be too anxious to get it. Well, I want it in 30 days. That won't give you sufficient time. So it suggests to try to get a, hear a hearing date at least 70 days away after you to get your court papers to give you adequate time to accomplish all of these tasks. Okay, hope that answered that question. And uh, Simone, I'll from here. Simone, just really quickly, um, there was a follow up question, and I apologize, I lost um, um, some internet service here. Uh, one of the follow up questions before we move on to the next topic is um, if someone in the defendant's home was served, can I email the paperwork to the defendant? So I'm assuming that, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but the defendant has already been served by substituted service and can the paperwork be uh, emailed, uh, the second copy be emailed to the defendant? Well, as of now, the court hasn't changed the rules. So the rules uh, stipulate that the second copy has to be sent by first class mail to that address. That's the follow up. If you look at the form SC 104, it explicitly says that after serving it to someone else under substituted service, it then has to be mailed first class mail and it has to be done at least 25 days prior to the court date. Now, who knows what the future is going to hold and, you know, whereas they're going to change what the rules are because of. How, how we do business and how, how prevalent uh, email is, but at this time you have to follow those rules. Great, thank you. Um, so what we'll do is we're going to do the next part of our webinar, which is going to be the exchange and submission of evidence. Uh, once again, if you do have questions, please be sure to drop them in the chat and we will answer, answer all of the questions at the end of the next video. Welcome to the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. In this video, we will explain the new rules the Small Claims Court has adopted for the exchange and submission of evidence. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, many litigants are requesting to appear remotely for their small claims hearing. Prior to the pandemic, evidence was presented to the court and exchange with the other parties on the date of the hearing. Now all evidence must be submitted to the court as well as all parties in the case prior to the date of the hearing. The evidence can either be mailed 
or personally delivered, the court and the parties must be in receipt of the evidence at least 10 days before the hearing. The new procedure for the exchange and submission of evidence is outlined on forms LASC CIV 278 and 279. The court should have provided you with both of these forms. However, if you did not receive either of these forms or you need an additional copy, please visit the website at lacourt.org and click on the tab Forms, Filings and Files and scroll to the Small Claims Forms. If you would like to provide written evidence to support your case, be sure to follow these steps. The first step is to mail or deliver a copy of the evidence to all parties. If you mail the evidence, be sure to request proof of mailing. The second step is to provide a copy of the evidence to the court. In an envelope, include a copy of the evidence, the completed form LASC CIV 278. Be sure to also include the proof of mailing. If you would like the court to return your evidence after the hearing, you will also need to include a self-addressed envelope with the correct amount of prepaid postage. Remember to use the mailing label provided on form LASC CIV 279. When submitting the envelope to the court, it can either be mailed or placed in the civil drop-off box located outside the courthouse. It is important to note there is an exception. If the defendant, in other words, the person being sued, files with the court a defendant's claim, SC-120, there may not be enough time to submit and exchange evidence 10 days before the court date. Regardless, all parties should follow the procedure, and the judge will decide on the day of the hearing if the court will consider the evidence. Remember to always keep copies of the evidence, proof of mailing, and forms for your records in case they have to be resubmitted. Thank you for joining us. We hope this video outlined the new court procedures for the exchange and submission of evidence. Be sure to check out our other small claims videos located on our website. Uh, even though the video was really clear, I just want to make sure that everybody uh, is, uh, has, has, no, has no concerns or questions about how to do that. So I'm just going to go over what the video said briefly. On the form 278 that was referred to in the video, on the back of the page, it has 10 steps. And the 10 steps tell you what to do when you want to um, exchange and submit evidence. So let's say, for instance, the plaintiff got into a car accident and they want to sue the defendant for damage to the vehicle. The kind of evidence that the plaintiff might have is pictures of the car where it's been damaged, they could have an estimate to repair the vehicle because that's the money they want to have back. They might have a police report and they even might have an estimate of what it's going to cost for a car rental for the week that the car is going to be in the shop while it's being prepared. So those are four pieces of evidence. So you take that evidence, the plaintiff, and you put it in a pile. Okay, that's your original evidence. Now you make photocopies. You make one photocopy for the defendant, or if you have two defendants, then you're going to make two sets, and then you have one set for the court. Okay, so you take the evidence that you want to send the defendant, put it in an envelope. You should also include the form 278 because it says on the instructions they want you to use that form for all of your mailing. So you put that form in the envelope also. 
So now you seal the envelopes for the defendants. Now, as uh, Jessica is showing on the screen, it shows mailing label. They want you to use this mailing label for the defendants and the court. That's why they gave you two. If you need more because you have multiple defendants, then you're going to just print up some more. So on the outside of the envelope to the defendants, you're going to paste on this mailing label, fill in the information that they are asking, and take it to the post office. Now that you take it to the post office, you want to have evidence that you really mailed it. The post office has a very convenient form. It's called certificate of mailing. It costs about a dollar fifty, and the postal clerk will stamp this document, where it shows that on that date, yes, you did in fact mail an envelope to the party who's in the lawsuit. So you want to keep this document. That's your proof of mailing. It's good to make a copy of it because you're going to have to send that proof of mailing to the court. So you want to have one copy for yourself and a copy that you give to the court. So now we're done. We sent the uh, required evidence to the defendant. Now we need to send it to the court. So it's the same procedure. You take your evidence, you put it in an envelope along with that form 278 where you itemize what the evidence is that's included in the envelope. You also write down when you either delivered or you mailed the evidence to the other parties because you can also deliver it. does not have to be mailed. Mailing sometimes is more convenient. So you put that in the envelope along with a photocopy of the certificate of mailing showing that you did in fact mail it to the defendants. So on the date of the court, if the defendant says, I didn't get anything, they never sent me stuff, the judge might say, well, I guess that's possible, but I do see here along with their evidence that we have that they did go, the plaintiff did go to the post office and here's evidence that they did mail you something. So that goes inside the envelope. Now. For the court, on the outside of the envelope, you're also going to use that mailing label. Now, people have asked, do I need to use the mailing label if I drop it off at the court? Because the court has a drop-off box in front. You don't have to mail it. Yes, you should use that outside mailing label even if you don't mail it because that way, when the court gets that envelope, they know right away, aha, this is evidence for a small claims case. So they don't need to open the envelope. Potentially, maybe things get misplaced in terms of your evidence. They can take that envelope intact and put it immediately in the case folder. So this should be used regardless. As a safeguard too, if you do mail it to the court, you might want to get a proof of mailing also from the clerk showing that it was mailed to the court. So I hope that completely clarified uh, the procedure. I'm now open to any questions that people might have about the small claims process. It can be about the topics that we discussed, serving or how to get your evidence there or anything related to small claims court. So I'm here for yeah. any questions. Great. Um, so thank you for that, Simone. Um, yes, continue dropping your questions into the chat. Um, I will be sure to ask Simone. Uh, we do have about 15 minutes for you to um, answer questions. We do have a few of them. Uh, the first one is when submitting evidence, can you use copies or do they have, do you have to send originals? You should never send originals because what if things get lost? So you should always send copies, but make sure they're good copies. You don't want to send something that they can't read is, you know, not really legible. So uh, copies. If if uh, the judge for some reason feels that uh, a original is needed, whether it's a deed or whether it's a contract or whatever, the judge would request it from you at that time, and then you would make arrangements to get it to the judge. But that would be at the judge's decision. Great. 
Um, and I know you did go over the process of mailing um, the evidence to the court, uh, making sure that they have their certificate of mailing. But do you know um, if you can exchange and or submit the evidence uh, by fax or by email? Is that an option? As it stands now, the instructions are the instructions. So when it comes to any kind of court procedure, even though I can understand logically that should make sense, when it comes to the court, you got to follow the letter of the law, how they wrote the order. So at this point in time, this is the procedure. Those are good suggestions. And in the future, if, uh, if possible, that the court might make adjustments. But for now, you follow the instructions. Great, thank you, Simone. So now we're going to move away from any exchange or submission of evidence. It looks like all of those questions um, are done and we're going to move over to our general ones. Um, what is the minimum or maximum you can file in a small claims court? Okay, we have an overview video that's posted on our, uh, our DCBA website, which is really terrific. Uh, the shorter version is the 26 minute one, which is, is, you know, provides you all the information. Basically, the maximum is $10,000 for an individual to sue or a business that's comprised of more than one person, meaning a partnership or a corporation. The maximum is 5,000. There has been an exception that is made. It has to do with back rent uh, during the uh, pandemic in which there is no maximum at this time. That's explained in our overview video because uh, small claims court is being used now uh, to resolve issues about a lot of COVID unpaid rent because people are, are really struggling in this pandemic. Now, the dates that are listed in our overview video indicate Papers will not be accepted until March 1st, but there have been extensions by the state of California or various counties. So that date that's in the video that says March 1st has been moved up, I think, to at least August 1st or September 1st. But this is very much a, a problem that is in flux. Everything is in uh, changing depending on uh, economic circumstances. So you really need to stay on top of what are the current requirements at this time. I suggest to get the up to the date information if your issue is the COVID back rent is to call up our uh, housing division, our rent stabilization unit that their phone number is going to be posted in the chat to find out what are the uh, requirements in suing for this COVID rent, what are the filing dates, et cetera, to get the current information from them. But yes. other than that exception, we're at 10,000 for an individual and 5,000 for a company. And now another um, another thing to our attendees, please keep your chat box open um, as we're putting links on there. We're putting the contact information to our rent stabilization unit. So that way you um, can definitely use those resources. Um, okay, again to another general question. Um, is it correct that you can't sue a licensed contractor in small claims court? You can sue. Anybody, anything except one exception, you cannot sue the federal government. Other than that exception, and you also have to be able to uh, serve papers in, in California in terms of the serving aspect of it. But yes, in fact, you can serve a licensed contractor. What we often suggest that our department is prior to suing is to contact the contractor state license board because if they are licensed, the board is very helpful with uh, mediation and seeing what can be resolved. So uh, that should be your first step in terms of resolving it before you think about going to small claims court. But if it does not work out and you want to sue, definitely you can sue. Great. Um, and the other question for the general one, how long does it currently take for a case to be heard? 
Well, it, that's a hard question because as soon as the pandemic hit, some cases were postponed even five or six months. It's getting on track better. So cases are heard uh, earlier than that. A lot depends on the court location. So let's say you need to file, for instance, in Compton Court. Compton Court might have a faster turnaround time than Van Nuys Court, because it all depends how many cases they have to hear. So it is uh, a situation by situation basis. You would want to contact uh, the filing court and say, if I file today, when can I expect to have a court date scheduled? So there's no firm answer that we can give you at this time till things kind of uh, settle down. Great, thank you, Simone. And the other question is, and we have about um, about five minutes to continue answering questions. If for whatever reason we are unable to get to your question, please leave us. Your, you can either send it to the panelists or to the host. Your contact information along with your question. I know we don't have that much time anymore. In about five minutes, we'll be able to. We're going to wrap up our our webinar. So again, if for whatever reason we were unable to answer your questions, please send us um, over your contact information, and we would be sure to give you a call back. Um, the uh, question that I have is. I received papers that I found when I opened the door. The hearing is sooner than 10 days. How can I exchange evidence? You do the best that you can. In other words, the court understands if you have limited time, then you just are going to explain that at the court hearing. Now, the other part to that question is, if you just got it at the door, that is not proper service because service has to be where somebody opens the door, either the defendant or somebody who lives or works with the defendant. The problem about saying, okay, I wasn't served properly, therefore I'm not going to attend the hearing. The difficulty is if the plaintiff has the proof of service filled out to make it appear as if you opened the door and it was handed to you, the judge has no way of knowing what actually happened. So it's up to you what you want to do and in terms of how, how you want to handle the situation. One is don't show up, you weren't served right. Another way is to show up at your hearing anyway, alert the judge to what happened, and then the judge is going to decide if they're going to continue the case so that service can be done properly or uh, dismiss the case for improper service. Those are all decisions that come from the judge. So whether to show or not show, you need to evaluate what can happen either way and make a decision. Great, thank you, Simone. And it looks like we have um, time for maybe just one more question. Again, um, I do see a few other questions that we may have not answered. If you still need assistance, please um, send the host or the panelist your contact information along with the question and we'll be sure to give you a call back. Um, and the last question is going to be, the defendants have moved and I don't know their present address. They have an attorney. Can I serve their attorney? It looks like the attorney would be within LA County as well. Well, the answer in small claims court is no. In regular civil legislation, I'm not exactly sure of the rules of service, but I think people have served attorneys in that situation. Small claims court, because on the initial trial, there are no attorneys. There's only attorneys on appeal cases and small claims. That's why the attorney cannot be served. It has to be the individual themselves. So you've got to do your best, like we discussed about it in the first question, is to try to really locate where they are residing or where they are working so you can serve. Is that our last question? Um, I think so. I, we are just about two minutes away. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll leave the chat and the uh, Q&A session open for everyone to leave their contact information just in case we were unable to answer your questions. We did have a ton of information. Please note that the, 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 the webinar was being recorded and will be uploaded on our website. 
The link is on the screen. Uh, you'll be able to see all of our videos along with the video vignettes. Um, and we are continuing to create additional content. So always be on the lookout for that. Thank you so much for joining. Um, be on the lookout for the next webinar. Uh, we'll be sure to be doing one bi-weekly. And one, one last point. Yes. Take the survey. We need yeah. to know how we're doing and we want to have suggestions for future webinars. So yes. help us out. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. Bye-bye. Thank you.